Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So now Rafi continuing with Surah Nisa. These are verses 66 onwards. And Allah is saying over here, And if we had decreed upon them, kill yourselves or leave your homes, they would not have done it except for a few of them. But if they had uh, done what they were instructed, it would have been better for them and a firmer position for them in faith. So again, we're talking, if you, if you remember in the previous verses, it was about the hypocrites. Yes. Right? So the idea being that Allah keeps telling them that you need to obey the Prophet, but what would they do instead? The hypocrites? Yes, the hypocrites. Remember they, Munafiks? Yeah, they would say that they are Muslims, but inside they were not actually. They would try to <laughs> lead other Muslims astray. Oh, wow. They would um, agree to worship Allah, but they would yeah. not listen to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. No, that's not what you said. It's the same thing. No, it's not. Because they would say that um, we do not agree with what he says because, uh, um, because he's a human uh, he's a and he's coming up with his own opinions. We only believe what comes from Allah. So um, they would have this issue. And so Allah is saying, now this is a continuation. Allah is saying when they were told, kill yourselves, which means jihad, oh. be willing to sacrifice your life for the sake of Allah, or leave your homes, meaning uh, you have to migrate. Now, migration was important because the command for jihad, uh, for jihad and for uh, to migrate, hijrat, mm -hmm. had come so that uh, Allah was telling all the Muslims that there is an Islamic state that has been established. So if you are still living in your polytheist tribe and you cannot practice Islam openly over there because, of course, you know, uh, people in the entire Arab region, they still hated the Muslims, right? So because um, they were not able to practice Islam, they had to do it quietly uh, inside their homes. They, there was no mosque. Uh, it wasn't possible for them to go out and do Juma prayers. You know, these things uh, were, were not there. Allah told them, everyone migrate and join the Prophet in this Islamic state. And plus, of course, you have to strengthen your army as well. Mm -hmm. Now, and, one question. They had to migrate to Medina, but the Munafiks and they, they were already in Medina. Right, but there, this is talking about people who were Muslims, mm -hmm. and they were outside of Medina, so they had converted to Islam. But when they were told that the command has come in the Quran and Allah is saying jihad and hijrat, compulsory, do it. Okay, so it, it's not it's not like something you can do. It is something Allah is saying you must do it now. They would say. Um, no, I'm sorry, a jihad is too hard and migration, you know, you, you want us to leave our home and our family and, you know, um, the entire tribes that, that we have always been a part of, we're so affiliated to them, we cannot leave them. Does this still apply to nowadays? Well, uh, let's first understand the situation then. So what Allah is saying is that when you are told that you have to migrate because the Prophet has given the order, it's coming from God. And you are simply saying no, because you're more attached to your family, to your relatives, to your possession and house and everything. Then Allah is saying they are now being called hypocrites. They are basically people who are munafik. So they're telling people that we are Muslims and we are, and you know, it's important to follow the Prophet and to follow God, but they're not doing it themselves. Mm -hmm. And Allah is saying, if a few of them did it, but most of them did not, if they had done it, it would have been better for them. And then we would have given them a huge reward and we would have guided them to the straight path. And whoever obeys Allah and the Messenger, those will be uh, with the ones upon whom Allah has bestowed a favor of the Prophets, the steadfast, affirmers of truth, <clears throat> the martyrs, the righteous, and excellent are those as companions. Who are martyrs? <clears throat> the people who have become shaheed. Oh. So Allah is saying, if you obey Allah and the Messenger, then you will be with the ones when you are uh, on the day of judgment, you will be grouped alongside the very best. And who are the very best? The prophets, number one. The martyrs. Number two, those who are very steadfast, steadfast and affirmers of truth. Always honest people. Okay. Number three, the, 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 martyrs. Uh, the martyrs who have embraced shahadat. And number four, the very, very righteous who are always doing good deeds. So Allah is saying, if you were to follow and obey everything the Prophet says and that Allah says, on the Day of Judgment, you will be grouped with these people. And excellent are they <clears throat> as companions. That is the bounty from Allah and sufficient is Allah as a knower. Now, this can also have a general meaning. It does not just mean that on the Day of Judgment, you will be grouped with those people. What this also means is that in this life, when you, when you decide that I want to walk on the path of Islam, 
-hmm. It's going to be very hard, right? People will make fun of you. People will call you a Malvi. People will call you an extremist. If you uh, tell someone that, you know, the thing that you're doing is wrong because uh, it's haram or Allah does not like it, people will start, uh, uh, they will laugh at you. They'll say, you know, you're just not cool enough, right? So it's a huge struggle. And according to the hadith, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said towards the end of times, following Islam is going to be so difficult that it's uh, almost as if you're holding um, some hot coal in your hands. You know, it's going to be incredibly painful, incredibly difficult <clears throat> to be walking on the path of Islam. So Allah is saying, when you decide to do that, okay, when you decide that I'm going to walk on the path and you face a lot of difficulties, but you are still steadfast, you still say, no, I'm not going to deviate then Allah will give you friends um, who are very, very uh, good, very righteous. He will provide that company for you. You will automatically find the right kind of people who will motivate you, boost you, strengthen you, and help you. This is how Allah ends up helping his people. Right? So, um, now, then Allah says in verses 71 onwards, O oh, you who have believed, take your precautions, and go forth in companies or go or go forth altogether. And indeed, there is among you he who lingers behind. And if disaster strikes you, he says, Allah has favored me in that I was not present with them. But if bounty comes to you from Allah, he will say, surely, as if there had never been between you and him any affection. Oh, I wish I had been with them so I could have attained a great attainment. Oh, this is basically saying... Um, that when you go for jihad, the munafiks or the the hypocrites, they would stay behind. Uh, and if the Muslim army would lose, uh, they would say that that Allah has favored me. Yeah. Because uh, because I did not go with them, and now I've been saved. But if the Muslim uh, would have won and attained a huge uh, war booty, then they would say that uh, uh, I wish I could have been with you. Then they feel jealous. Yeah. Then they feel jealous, and Allah says they behave as if. Um, as if there had never been between you and them any affection. In other words, hatred, rage, anger. They forget that these Muslims were like my brothers. They encouraged me to go for jihad. They were always there for me. I was the one who said no. And so then suddenly it's rage and anger at them that how come these people have you know, been able to obtain all the spoils of war and I now get nothing. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And this is a characteristic feature of hypocrites, which... Again, Allah is telling us, so keep a check on you. Make sure you aren't doing the same thing. So then Allah says, um, so let those fight in the cause of Allah who sell the life of this world for the Akhirah. And he who fights in the cause of Allah and is killed or achieves victory, we will bestow upon him a great reward. Now, interestingly, Allah is telling you when you forget this dunya, go for Akhirah, which means do everything that Allah wants you to do. And if you go and fight in the cause of Allah, two things will happen. Now, he says you'll be killed, which means shahadat, the best death ever. Or he says victory. But what about if you lose in the war? Losing is part of victory. <laughs> How is it part of victory? Because it uh, basically shows you... Uh, the weakest links of the chain. Ooh, weakest links of the <laughs> chain. <laughs> it's victory because you have to redefine victory. It's not victory in terms of the fact that I won. That is what we say in dunya. In the eyes of Allah, victory means you have attained what? The pleasure of Allah. Thank you. So two things. Either you will um, obtain shahadat. Or you will come back having attained Allah's pleasure. Uh, um, victory in terms of winning the war or losing the war, that doesn't matter. What matters is you went, you fought, you did not run from the battlefield. You did it only for Allah. You are victorious. Period. That's all mm -hmm. that matters. Right? And so Allah says, and what is the matter with you that you fight not in the cause of Allah and for the oppressed among men, women and children who say, our Lord, take us out of this city of, of oppressive people, appoint for us from yourself a protector and appoint for us from yourselves a helper. Those who believe fight in the cause of Allah, those who disbelieve fight in the cause of Taghut. So fight against the friends of Shaitan. Indeed, the plot of Shaitan has always been weak. 
So Allah is giving a justification that jihad that Allah was talking about at this time and the kind of battle that even we have to do is not because this is the way of spreading Islam. You can spread Islam through peaceful preaching. Allah is saying this battle at this moment, the Muslims are being told jihad is important because the entire Arab region is hating Islam. <clears throat> so in every Arab tribe, if they find out there's a family who has converted to Islam, they will start oppressing them. Now, the problem was Allah had given this command, everyone do hijrat, right? Some people chose not to do hijrat. Fine, they are being labeled as hypocrites. But then women, children, old people, uh, people who are ill, they cannot do hijrat. They cannot walk for miles and miles all the way to, to Medina. It's not like you had cars or planes at this time. So mm -hmm. for them, they were stuck. They wanted to join the Prophet, but they were stuck and they were being oppressed. And this happened in the entire Arab region because now they suddenly said, okay, let's all come together and really attack the Muslims. So Allah is saying jihad is important not because this is the, your way of spreading Islam, because you have to help the oppressed people. The oppressed people who would pray to Allah and say, Allah, take us out of this misery, out of the city of oppressive people, a point for us from yourself, a protector, a point for us from yourself, a helper. So Allah is saying, Allah is not going to come down and do it himself. Allah is saying, you are the, the vasila. You are the people that I've selected. You guys do uh, go ahead and help these people. My blessings will be with you. I will make sure that you guys win. You just have to follow my command. But there are people who need you. Mm -hmm. Now, coming to what's happening nowadays, when you find that people, there are Muslims in different parts of the world who are being oppressed, they need to do hijrat. They need to come into a, a, a country where there is Islam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Pakistan, so many. But if they cannot, they don't have the money to do it. They are women, they are children, they are, uh, for instance, old people, they are sick people. For whatever reason, they just cannot, they don't have the money or you know, the situation. Then it is incumbent upon the Muslim nations to do jihad and to help and stop the oppression that is taking place. That is exactly the point of battle. And then Allah says, have you not seen those who were told, restrain your hands from fighting and establish prayer and give zakat. But when fighting was ordained for them, at once a party of them feared men as they fear Allah or with even greater fear. And they said, our Lord, why have you decreed upon us fighting? If only you had postponed it just for a short time. Say the enjoyment of this world is little and the hereafter is better for you of, uh, is better for he who fears Allah and injustice will not be done to you even as much as a thread. Not even this tiny amount of injustice will not be done to you. Now, <clears throat> uh, talking about the, uh, a buddy slave. no, no, this is all focus on Muslims. This is all focus on the ummah, talking mm -hmm. to the believers and talking especially to the munafiks. Now, what's interesting, <clears throat> Allah says, have you not seen those who were told restrain your hands from fighting? So do prayer zakat and everything but don't fight right now when when did this Makkah. happen Makkah. okay so the people when they were out of Makkah, uh those people were called the what muhajirin. muhajirin when the muhajirin have joined the ansar in medina now these people the muhajirin they really wanted to fight because they had seen so much oppression and torture they wanted allah to give them an opportunity people like hazrat umar like hazrat hamza they were like they were ready to fight but Allah in initially said, no, you have to restrain your hands. So now later on when the, now um, later on what happened when they went to Medina, the Munafiks would jump in and say, oh, we feel so bad for what has happened. We wish Allah gave us just one command to do jihad. We would love to fight for you guys. You are our Muslim brothers. How dare the people say this to you? You know, they would say, use these words just to show everyone, look at my love that I have in my heart for God and for these beautiful Sahabas. You know, how dare the people of, of, of Quraysh treat you like this? And then when, when the command came for jihad, they said, Allah, why have you decreed upon us fighting? Couldn't you postpone this for just a little bit longer? I mean, why right now? And that's why Allah is saying, then they ended up fearing men more than they feared God. 
So at that time, it was all about Islam and God and, you know, all these amazing things they were saying. And then suddenly they said, oh, my God, you want us to fight against the Quraysh? And they feared men more than they feared God. And so Allah is saying, listen, the enjoyment of this dunya is just for a couple of more days or months or years. That's it. But the enjoy, but akhirah is what you need to be uh, aiming for. If you don't want to do jihad right now, then that's fine. You don't have to do it. But you will be able to live in this dunya and enjoy all of its comfort for just a couple more months or years. Eventually, you're going back to Allah and then it's going to be an eternal life of misery. Then Allah says over here, by the way, do you see people nowadays who behave like this? Where they give a lot of um, amazing comments like this and then suddenly when they're told, okay, do it. Then they suddenly back off and say, oh, no, I was just, you know, I wasn't serious about that. Yeah. That's what you call a monophic, right? So, again, this is important not because Allah wants you to start pointing out who the hypocrites are, but because he wants you to keep a check on yourself, you might be behaving like that. So you and I, we might be making these amazing statements to people, and then later on we say, oh, well, I was just joking about it. You know, I wasn't serious. Allah saying, everything that comes out of your mouth, I will hold you accountable for it. So be careful. So then Allah says, wherever you may be, death will overtake you. And even if you should be within towers of lofty construction, when death comes, you won't be able to, uh, you won't be able to hide or run. But if good comes to them, they say, this is from Allah. And if evil comes to them, they say, this is from you. Who's you? Rafi, mm -hmm. is it you? <laughs> um, who are these? Um, who are they talking to? Uh, the Muslims. It says not you all. It says you. The prophet? Yes. So then they would say if it's evil, then it has come from you. Say all things come from Allah. So what is the matter with those people that they can hardly understand? Can you see Allah's frustration and anger now? I mean, how many times Allah is uh, Allah saying, how many times do I have to say the same thing over and over again? Why just Why won't you just stop behaving like this? And the thing that, that the Munafiks would say is when they would get like victory, or suddenly, you know, something good would happen towards the ummah. They would say, oh, yes, this is coming from Allah. They would not say anything nice about the Prophet. But the minute something bad would happen, there was defeat, there was a famine, there was a, a shortage of food, um, there was any problem that the ummah faced, they would say, you know what, this is coming from this man, Muhammad, peace be upon him. It, this was his choice, this was his decision, and all of this bad stuff that's happening to us, it's because of him. And Allah is responding by saying, tell them everything comes from Allah. So days uh, where there's ease and days where there's hardship, there's khair and everything, and it all comes from Allah. And what comes to you of good is from Allah, but what comes to you of evil, that is from yourself. And we have sent you, O Muhammad, peace be upon him, to the people as a messenger, and sufficient is Allah as a witness. Now this has to be explained. First of all, when something suddenly bad happens to you, there is a test, there is a calamity, all right? The first thing you have to do is you have to um, go back and start thinking uh, that have I been doing things in the past which, were, which was a huge violation of Allah's commands? Maybe this is what we call karma. So maybe I really hurt someone's feelings and now this bad thing has just happened to me. Maybe I was consuming sood and now suddenly I've, I've lost all, all my money. Maybe I was involved in gambling or alcohol or I was just doing things that, I, that are clearly haram and now this bad thing has happened to me. So therefore this evil that has happened is because of something I did. Therefore I need to do tawba and, and change myself right now. And if you do that tawbah and you change yourself, then Allah will, he will give you back the blessings and he will remove that hardship. Second option, you have something bad that happens. You start thinking and you say, well, no, I wasn't doing anything haram. I don't consume sooth. I don't do this. I don't do that. I'm always trying to do my five time prayers. I really am trying to help other people. I honestly cannot think of something. I mean, I, I might have I made a few mistakes, but then all humans make small mistakes. But I cannot think of anything that I really have done wrong. In that case, it's just a test that comes from Allah. Allah has promised you that he will test you so that you can inculcate, you can learn sabr, you can learn tawakkal, you can learn all of those things because those things will only come when something is taken away from you and Allah tells you, okay, fine, just wait. There's nothing you can do. 
You have no control right now. There's nobody uh, that you can go around begging and, and asking for help. So Allah will take it away from you and says, okay, what will you do? So initially crying, screaming, oh my God, you've totally given up hope. But then after a while, you, you just say, okay, Allah, I've, I've, I submit to you. I'm tired. I've tried everything. Nothing is working. So I, I, sum, I submit myself to you. You tell me. And I know Allah, you'll give it to me whenever I deserve it. Now that could be weeks later, months later, year, years later. Wait. That's the only way of learning sabr. That's the only way of, of learning uh, tawakkal and trust. That's why Allah says, so if something bad happens to you, stop and think. If it's an evil, then maybe you did something in the past. This is karma. So this is something that, that you have done to yourself. Or maybe it's just a test. Maybe it's, you know, you haven't done anything bad, but a test has just come and you have to show sabr and you have to build that your iman. But to say that if something good happens, it's from Allah, if something bad happens, it's from the Prophet, that is absolutely wrong. And the reason this is very important for you guys to understand is because one of the biggest misconceptions of the Muslims is that if I get a promotion, if I get a good house and a good car, if suddenly I get more money, right? If suddenly I get good grades and, and things like that, Allah is happy with me. It's a blessing. If suddenly I lost my job, I lost money, something bad happened uh, you know, in my family, Allah is angry at me. It's no, it's not the opposite. Everything is a test. If you're taken, if something is taken or if something is given, both are tests. That's what this ayat is telling you. If you are given something, it's a test because Allah will ask you, okay, I gave you a promotion, I gave you more money, I gave you this amazing house and car. What did you do with it? Do you think I gave it to you just so that you could enjoy? You had more money than other people, so how did you use it for jihad? Right? Allah cannot ask that question to someone who's poor. And if Allah takes away something from you, then Allah will say, okay, did you show sabr? Did you show patience? Or did you say, okay, that's it, Allah, I'm not doing namaz anymore, I'm done. You get it? Mm. So this is what Allah is saying, everything that comes from me is khair. If I give you something, if I take away something from you, depending on how you behave, there is khair in it. That's it. Okay? And what this also proves to you is that if you are given a lot of money and you say, oh, yes, Allah is happy with me. So let me go spend and, and you know, enjoy dunya as much as I possibly can. And you completely forget why the money was given to you. Then you have done something, then you're doing something bad. And then later on, if, if something, uh, if you have a huge test, then that is an evil that has happened to you because of what your hands did. So then you, you look back in your life and you say, why did this happen to me? Where did I go wrong? And then you say, Allah gave me so much. Did I use it for Islam? Did I use it to help the poor? Or was I consumed with myself? Did I become arrogant? You understand? Mm. That's what Allah is teaching us. So then Allah says over here, um, he who obeys the messenger has obeyed Allah, but those who turn away, we have not sent you over them as a guardian. So if you obey the Prophet, then you are, then you are obeying Allah. If you disobey the Prophet, then you're, you're also dis disobeying God. You cannot, say, you cannot say, I'll disobey the Prophet, but, but I will obey God. You can't do that. Is that because Allah is the only Prophet? From whichever verse came down to it was the actual words. No, this is true for any Rasul. Yeah. For any Rasul who is sent. Because remember, every Rasul <laughs> says, follow me. Yes, but specifically, Allah No, this is true for every Rasul. Whenever there comes to you a Rasul, and you will see this in the, in the previous Qoms, the previous nations. There were many nations, by the way, uh, who did believe in God, but they said, we will not believe in the Prophet. And at the end, when the Azab came, they, they all were killed. So when a Rasul comes, you have to follow because the Rasul is teaching you how to implement Allah's commands. Allah's not talking to you directly. He's talking to you through the Rasul, right? So if you won't even listen to the Rasul, then how are you listening to Allah? You get it? So then um, Allah says, and they say, we pledge obedience. But when they leave you, a group of them spends the night determining to do other than what what you say, they, they plan to show disobedience. 
But Allah records what they are planning by night. So leave them alone and rely upon Allah. Sufficient is Allah as a disposer affair. So they can plan all they want. They won't be able to harm you. Is this when, you know, a lot of people, they wait outside of the house no, no, no. at night? That's to... Makkah. That's Makkah. This is Medina. Oh, yeah. Right? This is Medina. And this is not Allah talking about the Jews or the Kafirs. He's talking about the, uh, the hypocrites. The Munafiks. Then Allah is saying, do they, not, uh, do they not reflect upon the Qur'an? If it had been from anyone other than Allah, they would have found within it a lot of, disc- uh, a lot of contradiction. Now, the monophics would often say that, um, you know, like I said before many times, that the decisions passed by the Prophet, they are coming from him. It's not coming from God. And they would oppose his teachings and they would oppose his choices because even though at, at times he would tell them, this is something that Allah wants you to do. They would say, no. Well, because um, until you don't bring us a verse that specifically says this, we won't believe you. So they would constantly go against the Prophet. And this was their way of spreading mischief and promoting rebellion. You know, teaching other uh, naive Muslims as well that you guys, you know, you, you should question the Prophet as well. And so Allah is saying that, listen, if you believe that some of the things, some of the teachings of the Prophet are not coming from Allah. You know, so some of the verses that he's actually, um, he's explaining or the verses that he's reciting are not coming from God. He's just making it up himself. Then you would find a lot of contradiction in the Quran. Because if it is man-made, you will find a lot of problems in it. Right? And in specific, when the verses came about jihad or about hijrat, then a lot of the, the monophics say, oh, no, 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 this isn't from Allah. This is, this is him. He's, he's making it up. Because they didn't want to do jihad, right? They said, okay, so Allah was talking about peaceful preaching for all these years, and now suddenly he's talking about jihad? No, this is coming from him. And so Allah is saying, if you think the words coming out of his mouth, the teachings coming out of his mouth are from him, not from God, then you would have found a lot of contradiction in this. So why don't you reflect? Just think about it for a second. Right? And then Allah says, and when there comes to them information, now you will tell me what this means. When there comes to them information about public security or fear, they spread it around. But if they had referred it back to the messenger or to those of authority, then the ones who can draw correct conclusions from it would have known about it. And if not for the favor of Allah uh, upon you and his mercy, you would have followed shaitan except for a few. Any idea? Um, this is basically that uh, whenever the monophics or the the hypocrites get any news about, you know, um, something that is going wrong in the ummah, okay, right, they they immediately want to uh, spread it so they can get uh, as many uh, Muslims with weak iman, you know, to uh, leave Islam, uh, okay. and they will not inform uh, the Prophet of, or the people with strong iman right. because they knew that uh, that if they told them uh, then they would uh, uh, either address the problem or uh, tell the monophics uh, to, to not spread this yes that's actually very 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 <clears throat> good um let me just explain that a little bit more but that's brilliant what this is saying is that at times you know when there was a matter of public security or a matter of fear like for instance there's a tribe that's about to attack the muslims Okay, or something or, you know, there's um, there's some enemy or this entire army that is that is being prepared and they're marching towards uh, the city of Medina. Now, you ne- you have to verify such information, right? Mm. So what the monophics would do is if they heard this rumor, they would go around spreading it in the entire area. So Muslims of weak iman would start, uh, they would get scared. They would start panicking. And Allah saying, this is what you call contagion. Contagion means when th- something spreads like wildfire. Contagious? It's contagious, right. So it's called fear contagion or emotional contagion. Fear always spreads like fire. All right? Love and mercy will not spread that fast. Fear spreads like fire. Right? We all respond to fear a lot. And so Allah is saying if they were good Muslims, what they would have done is they would have gone to the Prophet or to the people who had authority like the Sahabas and they would have said, we just heard this news so that those people can first verify the information and then decide, OK, now is this correct? Should we spread it or is it not correct? Right. 
And again, this is Allah grooming them, but He's teaching us the same thing. When you hear information that can be detrimental to somebody else, okay, let's say it's about gossip. It's just pure gossip, okay? It's absolute nonsense. Maybe it is something which is, um, which is harmful about somebody. Maybe you're saying something evil or wrong about someone's character. Verify the information before you open your mouth. And if you cannot verify it, if it's impossible to verify it, because you didn't see it, right, your, yourself, or you didn't hear it directly from the actual person involved, then just be quiet. Don't open your mouth. Because it will spread like fire. So Allah says in verses 84 onwards, So fight, O Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the cause of Allah. You are not going to be held responsible except for yourself. And encourage the believers to join you that perhaps Allah will restrain the, perhaps Allah will restrain the might of those who disbelieve. And Allah is greater in might and stronger in punishment. Whoever intercedes for a good cause will have a reward therefrom. And whoever intercedes for an evil cause will have a burden therefrom. And ever is Allah over all things a keeper. And when you are greeted with a greeting, greet in return with one that is better. Better than it or at least return it in the same manner. Indeed, Allah is ever over all things an accountant. Allah, there is no God except him. He will surely assemble you for account on the day of resurrection about which there is no doubt. And who is more truthful than Allah in statement? Now, first of all, what does it mean to say when you are greeted with a greeting, greet in return with one better or at least the same? Um, it basically means, uh, what I think it means is like when you are visited by some guests, mm -hmm. Uh, and they bring you something, right? Because, you know, uh, they're visiting your house. Okay. So, so whenever you visit them, that would something better. Yeah, but this is talking about greeting. Greeting? So when you greet someone. Yeah, it's not saying gift. How do you greet someone? <laughs> well, How if you're you a mean? Muslim, you normally say, Assalamu alaikum. Like, uh, oh, you would greet someone. Like, so, someone. yeah. So if somebody greets you, you should greet them with the same liking or even better. I like a dua? Well, um, a dua, uh, it, can, it can mean that, or it just means in terms of the, the way that you um, speak, your tone, your enthusiasm. So someone says, Assalamu Alaikum, you, you don't say, ah, Assalamu Alaikum, I just walk away, like, who cares? Allah saying it's very important how you greet them back. Now, uh, why is this important? You know how um, sometimes if someone comes up to you and uh, if they greet you, you say, well, yeah, the way he said it to me, his tone, his facial expression, you know, I, I don't think he was happy to see me, right? Uh -huh. And even though that might not be true, but you start to have all these ideas in your mind just because of the way the person said, Assalamu Alaikum to you. Mm -hmm. So Allah is training the Muslims that even greeting this is very important because greeting is a beautiful way of spreading love and peace that first thing that you say assalamu alaikum that is a beautiful way of spreading love and peace so you could say assalamu alaikum but in a terrible way which will actually spread suspicion and doubt and hatred or you could say it in a beautiful way because what you're saying is in fact something which is amazing you're giving the other person a dua so Allah is saying it's not just the words, but it's even how you say it that that's going to be, uh, you will be held accountable for. If you're going to give someone a dua, do you say it while being really angry and, you know, you give a dua by showing a lot of love in your tone. Mm -hmm. So you can see that this is how the ummah is being told that brotherhood, sisterhood, this idea of unity will come when you even learn to say the basic greeting, but filled with love. So Allah is saying, if someone says it to you, you can say it in the same manner, but it's better say it, um, you can give the greeting back in an even better manner. Okay? And then if you intercede in a good cause, you will get a reward. If you intercede in a bad cause, you will share the burden. You understand what that means? Yes. Yeah, what? Basically, like, if you uh, do a, a good deed, or even if you think about doing a good deed, mm -hmm. then you do get, you know, uh, like... You get a reward from Allah? Yes, but this is talking about interceding. Now, what that means is, if somebody is thinking of doing a good deed, and, and you, you, help him do it. you jump in to help them, 
then even though the idea was his, you will also get equal amount of ajr because you uh, shared it. Him. Yeah, you were actually part of it. And if someone thinks of doing a bad deed, like spreading gossip about someone, hurting someone, coming up with this evil plan towards someone, and you jump in and help them in any way, even if it's a tiny, tiny thing that you did, but you helped it, then you will share the burden of the evil. So Allah will not on the Day of Judgment just call that person he will call you as well and say, well, you were part of it. And at that time you can say, oh Allah, but I only did this tiny amount. Even that tiny amount will not be acceptable on the day of judgment. Why did you even do that? Did you not know it was something that was evil? Okay. And here's the other interesting thing. Allah says, fight in the cause of Allah. And uh, Allah tells the Prophet, tell the believers that they should fight perhaps Allah will restrain the military might of the disbelievers. You see a huge difference. At the Battle of Badr, did Allah say, fight perhaps the, the you know, you guys will win? No. No. What did he say instead? I thought I would say, uh, angels win. You will definitely win. Definitely. At the time, definitely at the time win. of Badr, Allah says, you will definitely win because we have to now teach a lesson to the disbelievers. At the time of Uhud, did he say, well, fight, perhaps you might win? No. It was, okay, I'll send angels, I'll do this, I'll do that. We have to teach a lesson to the disbelievers. Right? Now you see it's like, encourage the Muslims to fight because perhaps Allah might control the might of the enemy. Uh -huh. Perhaps. Yes. It's not like, okay, definitely Allah will do it. Uh -huh. Right? Now, any well, idea? Yeah, I mean... Um, uh, basically because uh, to try and make the people with weak iman have more amount of, you know, blind faith in Allah that he will do it. it it's Instead of uh, suspecting that he might not do it, you have to keep a hope that he will. Yes, that's actually very good because... Uh, there are two reasons. First of all, in the beginning, don't forget it was the early uh, early period for the Muslims. They were still being groomed and they were fighting for the first time. So when they're fighting for the first time and they're fighting against the Quraysh, the keepers of the Kaaba, who nobody dares fight with because you have always learned ever since you were a kid that these people are being protected by the gods. So you are not going to fight with them. If at that time Allah said, fight, perhaps I might control the enemy. The, you know, it would be too tough for many of the Muslims to fight. So they needed to hear victory is certain. You know, God's with you. This defeat of the disbelievers has to happen. You just go for it. You understand? Mm -hmm. Same happened at the Battle of Ahad. But then after that, now it's been over three years. Now Allah was teaching them that, you know, if you go ahead and you fight, you will win or you might lose. It depends on what Allah wants. What's important is follow Allah's commands. If you follow Allah's commands very, very strictly, then most likely you will have victory. Mm -hmm. But in case you have a defeat, Allah can do whatever He wants. You, you are nobody to question Him. Remember, you are fighting for the cause of Allah. So victory, defeat, that is only in, in, uh, in God's hands. And whatever comes from Allah, there is khair in it. So if you are victorious, great. But if you face defeat, then that's not a time for you to say, okay, that's it, I'm done with Islam. Mm. And it was a way of teaching them, you are not fighting for the spoils of war. You are not fighting so that you can become victorious and famous and you, know, you can come back as brave warriors and everyone will praise you. You're fighting for God's sake. That's it. Keep that in mind. Right? Because if Allah keeps guaranteeing them, oh, go ahead and fight, you'll definitely get victory, then people will start fighting only because they know we will come back as brave warriors, people will be clapping for us, we'll have so much spoils of war. You know, that's what you start to imagine. Mm -hmm. So what's actually uh, encouraging you? What's actually motivating you? The dream that I will become rich, I will become famous. So mm -hmm. are you doing it for God? No. No, you're not. So that's what Allah is teaching them. That listen, when you do something for the cause of Allah, don't even think about uh, the outcome. The outcome is not in your hands. Just think about while you're going on this journey, you need to make sure you are following Allah's commands and you are not transgressing. 
And that's the lesson that me and you are being taught as well. So when I say, okay, I am going to, for instance, okay, this, um, the, these, these lessons that we're having, this tafsir that me and you are having and we're putting it up on YouTube, right? We're doing it purely for the cause of Allah. But if we end up saying that, no, what's important is we should get a lot of likes and we should get so many people to, to hear us and we should become extremely famous, then we're not doing it for God. We're actually doing it for fame. You understand? Mm -hmm. So Allah is saying the outcome is not in your hands. If nobody listens to you, great. If a million people are, are there and they're paying attention, even that's great. The outcome is not in your control, so don't even think about the outcome. Right? The more you think about the outcome, the more you are going to start thinking about dunya. And less, of, and you will forget that you are doing this purely for Allah's sake. So it doesn't matter. The outcome doesn't matter. Mm. Better, that's mm. a very, very important lesson. The number one reason why our young generation is facing depression because they do so much work and so much effort and their dream is the outcome. I will eventually get this. And then suddenly they find out, well, they, they were not able to get it. Why? Because, well, Allah just didn't want it. And they say, but why? Why didn't Allah want it? Do you get it? Mm. This is the training that the Muslims were being told. So then verse 88 um, and 89, Allah says, And what is the matter with you? That you are two groups concerning the hypocrites, while Allah has made them fall back into error and disbelief for what they earned. Do you wish to guide those whom Allah has already sent astray? And he whom Allah sends astray, never will you find for him a way of guidance. They wish you, you would disbelieve as they disbelieve, so you, you both will be the same. So do not take from amongst them friends until they do hijrat in the cause of Allah. But if they turn away, seize them, kill them wherever you find them, and take not from amongst them any friend or helper. Now you can see this is a very strict command coming. This is not talking about the munafiks who are in Medina. This is talking about the munafiks outside of Medina because Allah's command has now come. The Prophet needs your help. The Muslim army needs your help. The entire Arabia is, is uh, uh, basically attacking the Muslims. They want to destroy the city of Medina. Muslims everywhere should join the Muslim army right now. If you say, I love the Prophet and I love God, but I'm sorry, I cannot protect Islam. I cannot join the Muslim army. I cannot fight alongside the Prophet. Then that's not loving the Prophet, is it? Mm. Right? then that means you only love Islam when it suits you, otherwise you have your own issues. So Allah is saying that now you have to join the, the Muslim army, and if you don't, then Allah is saying these people are actually hypocrites, they are actually disbelievers. So then he's saying, seize them and kill them. And what that means is, the issue became that the Muslim army said, okay, we uh, now you're having a lot of battles take place between the Muslims and polytheist Arab tribes. A lot of wars were taking place every other day. Okay? And I'm not talking about the big wars like Badr and Ohad and the Battle of Trench. Meanwhile, in between, there were smaller battles taking place every other day because the entire Arab region was trying to destroy Islam. And so the Muslims had this question. They said, okay, if we're fighting with an Arab tribe and you know there's a battle going on. What if there's a Muslim in that Arab tribe and we end up killing him by mistake, right? I mean, a Muslim cannot kill a Muslim. So, I mean, isn't that a huge crime? You understand? And so they were being told that if you are in a situation like this, you are not actually killing a Muslim. Allah is saying you are killing a disbeliever because they actually are have become disbelievers because they're siding with the disbelievers. because they're siding they're they're there in their tribe they should have joined the muslim army they should have helped their own prophet who was being attacked so no they are they are not considered muslims in the eyes of allah so if you're having a fight with them and you end up killing them you've not killed a muslim so you don't have anything to actually worry about and then here when Allah says, what is the matter with you that you become two groups concerning the hypocrites? Now, when this verse came, there was uh, two groups uh, that, that emerged in Medina. One group said, yes, Allah is absolutely right. These people should have done hijrat. They should join us and they should be a part of us. And if they're not, then they're actually disbelievers. And another group said, well, you know, I think this is a bit too extreme. 
you know, I mean, these people, uh, you know, uh, maybe their iman is less and they're so attached to their tribes and their families and their homes and they're having difficulty actually coming and joining us. So for us to, you know, just consider them as disbelievers, it seems a little bit too harsh, right? So Allah is saying, what is the matter with you? Do you think that you guys can guide those, uh, the, those hypocrites when Allah has already told you they have gone astray? Allah knows what is in their hearts, you don't know. And Allah is not someone who is very unjust. So when Allah is telling you they are actually disbelievers, and Allah is telling you, I know the things that, that, is, that are there in their hearts, and He's saying that they would actually want you to disbelieve in the same way that they have disbelieved. They are not sincere people. Then verses 19-91, Allah says, except for those. Okay, now, so far, what we have just seen, is that Allah says you have to now, if you find the disbelievers, if you find the hypocrites, they are actually disbelievers. So if you find them, you can kill them because they should have migrated, right? Mm -hmm. Now he's saying, except for those who take refuge with the people between yourselves and whom is a treaty of peace, or those who come to you, their hearts strained at the prospect of fighting you or fighting their own people. And if Allah had willed, he could have given them power over you and they would have fought you. So if they remove themselves from you and do not fight you and offer you peace, Allah has not made for you a cause to fight against them. Now this is hard to understand. Allah is saying now that all of those Muslims who are outside of Medina, they are actually hypocrites except for women, children, old people and those who are ill. Right? All the other young men are actually hypocrites. If you find them, you can fight them. You've not killed a Muslim. Don't worry. He's saying, except for those between their people and your people, there is a peace treaty. So if there is a peace treaty between an Arab tribe, that is a polytheist tribe, and, uh, and the Muslims, the Muslims are being told, you can now not just go and start fighting them because there's a peace treaty. So in that Arab tribe, even though there are Muslims who Allah is calling disbelievers, Allah is calling them hypocrites, Allah is saying, you cannot just find them and kill them because there is a peace treaty between their tribe and, and yours. But can't you just end the peace treaty? You're not supposed to end the peace treaty over here. This is the early Muslim period. Uh -huh. You don't end peace treaties. The other option is Allah is saying, if there are people who come up to you, Muslims, and they say, listen, Muhammad, peace be upon him, the truth is, we, uh, we love you, we love Islam, but we're too scared to fight. And the truth is, we are too scared to join you and to join the Muslim army, because if we join your army and end up fighting against our own tribes, we will end up fighting against our own families and our own uncles and so on. And we, and we just don't want to do that. Mm. So they're being honest. And Allah is saying, in that case, as long as they keep giving you guarantees of peace, you cannot fight them. Which means if they keep coming up to you and saying, we are talking to our tribe and we are convincing them that do not attack the Muslims. Remember, this is a time of not offensive, this is defensive strategy. Muslims are being told, fight to defend yourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, if there's a peace treaty, then you don't face a threat from them, right? Because there's peace. But on the other hand, if there's another tribe and there's no peace treaty, so they can attack you. And right now, already mm -hmm. many tribes are attacking you. As long as the Muslims from that tribe, who Allah is calling hypocrites, as long as they come to you in Medina and they tell you, listen, Muhammad, peace be upon him, we don't want to join you because the truth is we have, we have a, lot, a lot of weak iman. But I promise you that we, have, we are talking to our tribes and we are telling them nobody will attack this man, Muhammad, peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. So although there's no formal peace treaty, they are giving you guarantees of peace. So they are still disbelievers? Allah is saying that in those cases you cannot kill them. You cannot attack their tribe and you cannot kill those people because at least they are doing this much. But those people who know that our tribe does not have a peace treaty with the Muslims and our tribe is already conspiring to fight this man, Muhammad, peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. And they have this information and they're not stopping their tribe, nor are they going to join the, the Muslim army and to help their prophet. They are clearly disbelievers. Mm -hmm. So that's why Allah is saying when a fight entails over them, you can kill them. Okay. And so verse 91 now is talking about exactly that case where I told you that people who would go to the Prophet and say that, um, you know, we will give you guarantees of peace. 
our tribe will not attack you, but I'm so sorry, our iman is so weak, we cannot leave our tribe and join you either. So Allah is saying, you will find others who wish to obtain security from you and to obtain security from their people. So they don't want to fight. They don't want to join the Muslims and they don't want to help their tribe fight the Muslims. They don't want to be part of any battle. They're too scared of any kind of war. Mm -hmm. So Allah is saying, every time they are, are, they are returned to uh, the influence of disbelief, they fall back into it. So if they do not withdraw from you or offer you peace, or restrain their hands, then seize them and kill them wherever you overtake them, and those we have made for you against them a clear authorization. And in this verse, um, see, what Allah is explaining is also something very important, that Allah is saying these people, because their iman is so incredibly weak, they barely have any iman, when they come and they, uh, they um, visit the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they uh, uh, pay attention to him, they listen to him, their iman suddenly becomes strong. But when they go back to their polytheist tribes and they live amongst people who are disbelievers, they start to move towards disbelief. That's why Allah is saying these are people who cannot be trusted because if a war did take place, they are very likely to side with their own tribes, their own people against Muhammad, peace be upon him. Because Allah is saying they're calling themselves people who have believed, but there is nothing in their hearts at all for Islam. Okay, so that's why Allah is saying over here, they keep, uh, every time they go back to their people, they return to the influence of disbelief. Mm. Right, so they don't have any idea really what Islam is. And so Allah is saying, if they do not withdraw from you or offer you peace, so as long as they give you offers of peace, as long as they keep coming to Medina, they uh, visit you, they give you guarantees of peace that we are telling our tribes, we promise you our tribe will never harm you, our tribe will never attack you. Therefore, Allah is saying that that's fine, don't attack them. But otherwise, if they don't do this, then you can seize them and kill them wherever you overtake them. Every time if you overtake them uh, uh, during a battle, kill them because you're, they're, they're not Muslims, they're actually disbelievers. Okay? And then Allah says, and never is it for a believer to kill a believer except by mistake. And whoever kills a believer by mistake, then the freeing of a believing slave and a compensation payment of blood money presented to the deceased family is required unless they give up, uh, give up their right as charity. Why? Because it was by accident. Like uh, you, you accidentally killed someone. Yeah, so you have to give blood money though, don't you? But that's if you do it purposely. No, if you do something intentionally, then it's the law of kisas. And the law of kisas means the other the person has to be killed unless the uh, the guardian of the person who was killed, unless he chooses to forgive. In which case, you, you can give blood money. But Allah saying, if you kill someone by mistake, there is some consequence. It's there not like... It doesn't matter. There is, an, there is a life that has, that has ended because of your accident. So there has to be some compensation because the person who was who was killed by accident belonged to a family and his people are now grieving. So there has to be some compensation. And plus, if, if you say that, well, um, you know, I was so angry that I got into a fight and by mistake the person died. If you don't face a consequence, you will not be able to control your rage. And if you keep getting angry and keep getting into fights and keep killing people by accident, that's not exactly Islam, mm. right? So there has to be a consequence to train you to control your anger. So then Allah says, um, so if you kill someone by mistake, you number one, free a Muslim, a believing slave. And number two, a compensation blood money has to be given unless the family uh, uh, is willing to excuse it as means of charity. But if the deceased, the person who died, if he was from a people at war with you, and he was and he was a believer then only the freeing of a believing slave is enough and if he was from a people with whom you have a peace treaty then compensation payment presented to his family and the freeing of a believing slave and whoever does not find one or cannot afford to buy one so they cannot afford to um, to free a believing slave uh, or they cannot afford this compensation then you have to fast for two months non-stop consecutively seeking acceptance of repentance from Allah, and Allah uh, is ever-knowing and wise. 
Now, this um, is, again, very important because Allah is saying, okay, you kill somebody, the person, um, it, and of course it was a mistake. You have to give blood money and you have to free a believing slave. But then the problem came, what if you kill somebody and the person you killed, his family belongs to another tribe and you Muslims are at war with that tribe. Now Allah is saying, the person who committed the crime has to free a believing slave, but, that, but that's it. You don't give blood money. The reason you don't is because if you give money to the family, that family belongs to um, a, a, a kafir tribe who you are at war with. If you start giving them money, they will use that money to do what? Uh, to make their military stronger. To make their army stronger and to attack you back. Now you have to understand that at that period of time, it's not like, you know, uh, people would go out and they would be like one person who was killed by mistake or maybe one person uh, after three months was killed by mistake. The Arabs were known for fighting even before the advent of Islam. They were always fighting. I told you outside of Makkah, it was constant warfare, right? Mm. I told you this, right? That if you had a caravan and you're traveling, it's very likely that you will get raided and there will be someone to attack you. It was It was common for them. Uh, this was part of their culture, constantly fighting. And after Islam came, the fights became 10 times worse because the entire Arab region wants to destroy Islam. So there are many, many uh, fights taking place. Mm. And so there were many, many cases of accidents, uh, uh, you know, of a death by accident. It wasn't just, you know, once in a while thing. It was actually very common. So if you have 15, 20 people who have been uh, killed by mistake by different Muslims and all of their families be belong to a tribe that you are at war with. That's a lot of blood money going to those people. Mm. And you're at war with them. They hate you. They want to extinguish Islam. Where do you think they will use that money? To, they won't um, use it for food to, and drink. Um, right. So that's why Allah is saying in that case, there's no blood money. But if there's a tribe... You but have peace treaty with them both. Then, if there's peace treaty, then you can then you have to give both, uh, and if you cannot afford it, and then Allah says, but whoever kills a believer intentionally, his recompense is Jahannam, wherein he will abide eternally, and Allah has become angry with him and has cursed him and has prepared for him a great punishment. Uh, there's no forgiveness. For it. That's why the law of kisas is there. The law of kisas means you have to kill him now because it's life for life. Um, because killing somebody means that you have basically taken away that person's right to ever do tawbah and to ever walk on the path of Islam because you ended his life. So That's a that huge... Um, the it, person killed? That is something, again, uh, the fact that you immediately asked me about Jahannam and Jannah, I keep telling you, judgment is Allah's prerogative. Nobody can answer that question for you. That's only Allah's prerogative. But what's important is for the person who did it, who's still alive, Allah is saying that was a huge thing that you did. To kill yourself is one thing. But a million times worse is to kill somebody else intentionally. And you have to understand that when you plan to kill someone, like it's, it wasn't an accident, you really have to have zero moral values. You must have destroyed your moral conscience to go ahead and plan how to kill someone and then to execute the plan. It's very hard to kill yourself and to commit suicide. And it's a million times harder to actually kill somebody else who is begging for mercy or who is in a very bad state and you just kill them. You have to be a really evil person. And so that's why Allah is saying in that case, it's going to be a, this situation. Um, but what we also see is that in the law of Kisas, we know that forgiveness is also there because a deceased family can choose to forgive. In which case the person, uh, the law of Kisas does not apply. He simply has to give blood money, right? But now because he's still alive, will he later on be given forgiveness if he sincerely does tawbah because he killed one person intentionally? Again, that's entirely up to Allah. Because Allah, has, we have seen in that verse that Allah says, other than shirk that is done, you know, where you uh, deliberately choose to uh, worship an idol. Other than that, Allah has said, I can forgive anything. Yeah, but it says here that he will go to Jahannam. Right. But again, when you study the Quran, we've also seen a verse where Allah says that when it comes to sharab, make sure that when you're coming near prayer, you know exactly what you're saying. 
So we could say, well, Allah is saying this, that means I can, I can have sharab. You have to take all the verses together and see the overall context. Yes, over here Allah is saying this, but at the same time we know that Allah says He can forgive anything. So, you, so it's a strict ayat over here to make the person understand, don't think I can kill someone intentionally and Allah says that He can forgive, so I'll just do a lot of tawbah later on. It's to make him know, yeah, I can forgive, but this is what most likely you are moving towards. So to really think about it before you do something as silly as this. So inshallah, we'll stop over here. Continue on in the next lecture with verses 94 onwards. Assalamu alaikum.